Which brings us around to the Cebu Lions of the Japanese Professional Baseball League. More and more world-class athletes are realizing that our body cells burn sugars and starches, not fats. And if you are an athlete about to run a marathon or play tennis or basketball, it is just irrational to sit down to a big T-bone steak and load up on fat and protein. That's exactly what you don't want. You want carbohydrates. And training tables around the world are springing up with fruits and pastas before a match, and that's really what athletes should be eating. Cebu Lions finished in last place in their league in 1981. Their coach put them on a vegetarian diet. The next year they came up, beat everybody in the league, and took the league championship two years in a row. There are now vegetarian weightlifters, and uh, Andres Cowling, Mr. Universe, down in California is a, a weight is a uh, vegetarian. James Donaldson, the big seven foot three in center of the Dallas Mavericks, is a vegetarian. Uh, there's marathon uh, runners that are vegetarians, uh, cyclists, tennis players. You, s you don't have to eat a bull to be as strong as one. That's that's for sure. We need a higher viewing of nutrition altogether. The one that we've been given simply isn't working very well. We need a higher viewing. What is the higher viewing? Well, let's talk about the one that isn't working very well. If you learn nutrition like I did, you learned it off this silly poster that hangs in grammar school walls all over this country, and it essentially says that food comes in four groups and four groups only. It comes in the milk group, in the meat group, in the fruit and vegetable group, and the grain group. And you better have some of every group every day, or you risk becoming sick, malnourished, or dead. <laughs> Subtle message, but it's what the kids are given. It's what I grew up with. Maybe it's what you grew up with. People, let's get real about the basic four food group scheme. It was not, repeat not, handed down to Moses on Mount Sinai with the Ten Commandments carved in stone. The basic four food group scheme was invented by the United States Department of Agriculture in 1956 to promote the sale of meat and dairy products. What do you really need to run your human body? Nutrition 101. What do you really need? You need five things. It has nothing to do with cheeseburgers and milkshakes. The human body has no nutritional requirement for animal flesh, none. And it functions superbly on a balanced, varied diet of plant-based foods. Five things you require. Protein, water, vitamins, minerals, and energy. That's what you require. You need a little bit of protein, 30 grams a day. It abounds in grains and legumes and fruits and vegetables. It's no problem getting enough protein. You need two quarts of water every day. That's found in the water you drink, the juices you drink, the fruit and vegetables that you eat. That's no problem. You need vitamins and minerals. They are found in green and yellow vegetables. Have a nice salad every day, a couple of carrots. You get all the vitamins that you need and all the minerals. We'll talk about vitamin B12 in a minute. Even that comes from plant-based foods. And you need energy to fire your muscles and make your nerves work. But energy is found in the sugars and starches that are found in fruits and vegetables and starches. And oils um, that are found in whole grains and avocados and vegetable oils. There's plenty of energy available. It's all you need. Protein, water, vitamins, minerals, and energy, and a little bit of fiber to keep the intestines working normally, but that's an automatic if you're eating whole grains and fruits and vegetables. That's all you need to run your human body, and all of these are found in plant-based foods. You never have to eat an animal if you don't want to. Well, where are you going to get your protein? Qu perennial question posed to vegetarians. The same place that elephants and buffaloes and giraffes get their protein, you get it out of plant-based food. Grains are loaded with protein. In your diet every day, you need 5% of your calories as protein. Grains are 10% protein. So all the breads that you eat, the, the dinner grains, rice and barley and millet, lots of protein. The pastas that are made from whole grains, lots of protein. Legumes. Anything that grows in a pot is a legume. Be beans, peas, chickpeas, lentils. 25% protein. Low to protein. Green vegetables. No one ever told me broccoli has lots of protein. It sure does. 15% protein in green vegetables. Nuts are a nice source of protein. People say, oh, I don't want to eat nuts. It makes you fat. Not if you're not running butter fat and cheese and egg yolks through your bloodstream. Have a handful of almonds. It's not going to hurt you, and you can use the calcium and the protein for good advantage. Sprouts are a nice source of protein. So are seeds, sunflower seeds, sesame seeds, pumpkin seeds. Lots of protein available. You cannot consume a calorically adequate 2,000-calorie diet made up of grains and legumes and green vegetables, nuts, sprouts, and seeds without guaranteeing yourself 50 grams of high-grade protein. It's in the, it's in the plant foods. And you don't have to combine grains with legumes. That whole wise tale that, that they're incomplete proteins is a myth. Uh, all plant proteins are complete in and of themselves. Grains are complete protein, beans are complete protein, greens, well, they're all complete. If you want to combine them, that's nice, but have no protein neurosis that if you don't put tofu spread in your whole wheat bread, that is a waste of time. They're all complete proteins all by themselves. And protein from plant foods do not gain the calcium out of your body the way protein from animal foods do. We're going to get to calcium. 
if you're not drinking milk, get your calcium from the same place cows get their calcium. I mean, think about it. Cows don't drink milk. Where do they get the calcium? They get it from green plants, all green plants have calcium in it, and all the broccoli and collards and kale that you eat. Nuts have calcium, seeds, grains, calcium's in all plant foods. It's easy to get enough calcium, and again, the important thing is that if you're not eating all this concentrated protein in the chicken and the fish, you'll hold on to your calcium and uh, you avoid osteoporosis. By the way, the ethnic group with the worst osteoporosis on the planet are the Eskimos. We eat all that fish, they wind up urinating out the calcium. They dug up an Eskimo skeleton of a lady who died 500 years ago in the ice. She had terrible osteoporosis. So what in the world do you eat? Good heavens, he's taken fish away from us and cheese away from us. What is there left to eat? Well, I really think we ought to be basing our diet on grains. Here is a cross-section of a kernel of wheat, but all grains, barley, oats, millet, rye, they're all basically built the same way. Here is the new young wheat plant, and this is the germ, and it's rich in protein and vitamins and minerals and oils and it's a great source of protein and minerals for us. Here is the starch, the carbohydrate that fuels the little plant. It fuels us just beautifully as well. And all this is wrapped in a layer of bran, the fiber, and it uh, is an excellent factor of nutrition for us. Now, who eats grains, you must say? We're, you know, we're not horses. Who eats grains? Well, we do. Uh, all the whole grain bread that you're eating has lots of nice, um, nice protein and fiber in it. And you can have four slices of this a day. You will not get fat. It's just carbohydrates and water and fiber, and you'll either burn it or pass it out. Uh, I hope nobody is eating white Kleenex bread anymore. If you're going to be eating whole grain bread, get the benefits of all the bran and the uh, protein and the fiber as well. Cereals, nice source of whole grain goodness, and there's lots of good whole grain uh, cereals available in the supermarket these days. Uh, this material is called tofu yogurt. I'll tell you about tofu yogurt in a minute. Uh, you can cook grains up and add a, a nut butter, like sesame seed butter, and turn it into a nice grain loaf, and it takes the place of uh, uh, meatloaf, and you serve it with gravies and sauces. You can take this same grain mixture and mix it up into burger patties and make grain burgers, and it takes the place of hamburgers, and you, set it, you, you serve it on a bun with lettuce and tomatoes and sprouts. One nice thing to do is one morning in your kitchen, uh, make up about 50 of these, wrap them in wax paper, and put them in your freezer. Now you've got a whole freezer full of burgers. Uh, you come time for lunch, whip out a couple, put them in the toaster oven, heat them up, and you got an instant lunch. You don't have to slave over a vegetarian banquet every time. Use your freezer. These foods last a long time. Pastas are a nice source of grain goodness. There's lots of whole grain pastas, corn pastas, oat pastas available these days. Grains can be added to soups. You know, vegetable rice soup, bean and barley soup, wonderful place to get grain goodness into your, um, into your uh, diet. And a big bowl of this kind of soup and a hunk of dark bread makes a wonderful, nutritious lunch with no cholesterol. Corn is a nice grain, enjoy it often. Rice is a nice grain, it uh, fuels half the people on the planet tonight. Legumes, wonderful source of protein. Uh, three tablespoons of this bean salad will give you as much protein as a chicken dinner, but it won't yank calcium out of your bones the way chicken flesh does. Well, the bean family is huge. Uh, lima beans, zuki beans, navy beans, great northern beans, lots of beans. People say, well, I want to eat beans because they give me gas. Um, the way around that, by the way, is to realize that most of the gas problem comes from a sugar on the surface of the bean called hemicellulose. And hemicellulose is soluble in water. So, if you're going to be making bean soup or bean chili, the night before, take the beans, put them in a pot, cover it with water, and let them soak overnight. The next morning, spill off the soaking water, rinse the beans a couple times, and you'll get rid of most of that hemicellulose and stay a lot more socially acceptable to your friends. <laughs> Lentils, nice source of uh, protein, soak them, season them, enjoy them. Probably the legume protein that's consumed most by vegetarians is soy protein in the form of tofu. Tofu is found at all supermarkets these days. Uh, you buy it with the, uh, uh, it's dated um, like milk, and you buy the tofu with the date furthest in the future, so it's the freshest tofu. Take it home, open the package, spill off the soaking water, take the block of tofu, put it in a bowl, cover it with water, and you store it in your fridge under water. Every morning just change the tofu water, and it'll keep for a while. But it shouldn't keep that long in your fridge, you ought to use it. Now some people say, I tried tofu once, yup, it's bland and yucky, it doesn't taste good. Well that's because tofu is a raw ingredient. Pastry flour doesn't taste great either until you do something with it. You've got to make it into cookies and cakes. Same thing with tofu. What do you do with it? Well, lots of things. It's a great meat substitute. It's a great transition food, even though it's a processed food. You can cube it up and put it in your stir-fried vegetables, and it takes the place of meat. We build protein here. It's here's soy protein and then the tofu, uh, green vegetable protein in the broccoli, nut protein in the walnuts. There are lots of protein. Serve this over rice and, or rice and noodles and uh, you'll get easily the protein that you would out of a meat meal but without the calcium losing effect of all that animal protein. Uh, tofu can be cubed up and added to salads. It takes up the place of, uh, it takes up the, the uh, salad dressing and um, enhances the flavor of the salad. 
You can scramble tofu. You can mash it up and add a yellow spice called turmeric and some sesame seed butter, and you put it in your skillet and it turns into a beautiful scrambled egg substitute that can be served over toast. You can mash up tofu and brown it and turn it into spaghetti and tofu balls. You can make tofu cream pie, tofu cheesecake. This is not a diet of deprivation, let me tell you, by a long shot. This slide is to remind me to tell you that you should not eat all your foods all processed. The more you cook food, the deader it gets. You heat up food and it starts uh, losing vitamin contents, the, the proteins coagulate, the fats denature. Um, cooking food devitalizes it. Eat as much of your diet as you can raw and fresh or lightly steamed vegetables. Um, my diet now is about 60-40 raw, 70-30 raw around there. I can't do a whole raw diet right now. It's not time for me to do that. When I try to do that, I lose weight and start dreaming about potatoes and spaghetti, and so I go back and eat cooked foods. But I, when I eat all cooked foods, I'm loggy and heavy, and uh, that doesn't feel good either. So think about moving your diet more towards uncooked foods. Vegetables, again, should be lightly steamed or just a quick stir-fry and a walk and out. Don't deep fry anything. Keep that food as fresh and vital as you can. I'm here to help dispel illusions. This is the kind of attitude we can no longer afford. We got to stop kidding ourselves about what we are doing on this planet because our dietary and lifestyles are ripping this planet up. Victor Hugo said, no army is as powerful as an idea whose time has come. We've got to start living reverently on this planet. We've got to start being gentle with the life support systems upon which we all depend, including the waters and the rivers and the trees and the animals and the earth itself. And changing our diet along with, eliminate, with uh, controlling our population and getting clean energy supplies, controlling our diet is absolutely key. You have that power every time you're in the supermarket or the restaurant. People say, think globally, act locally. There's nothing more local than your dinner plate. And you have the power to make yourself healthier and the planet. The, if I had to summarize this lecture in a single sentence, it's this. The single most effective thing anybody can do in order to make themselves personally healthier and make this ecosystem more stable and life-preserving is to reduce or eliminate the animal flesh in your diet. It is the single most effective thing that you can do. If we will do that, we will not only ensure a better future for us all, but we will redefine the relationship we have with every creature on this planet. If you want to know more about transitioning to a healthier diet, please stay tuned for information on available support materials.